Hello and welcome to our next painting webinar, Oxen. We're so excited that you guys joined us today. Um, today is Friday, March 5th. I have to think because, you know, I never know. Um, uh, 2021, we are recording the webinar and uh, we're excited about this new theme, new, this new collection. And um, we just wanted to um, tell you that we're grateful. And this is gonna be our ninth um, series of 2021. We started with toasters, Kamala Harris portraits. Uh, we did our own bed pillows. Uh, we looked up at the sky and uh, took snapshots of the clouds. And then we went from clouds to clowns and we did amazing portraits. Uh, and then we cover our eyes with the self-portrait with a blindfold. Um, American Skin, that was an amazing uh, portrait exercise. Uh, first dogs, super excited that we did that last week. And we're moving from dogs to oxen, another uh, animal portrait. So um, we have all the webinars up there. If you're watching from the future, we're um, congratulating you for making the decision to join the webinar. And uh, we hope you continue uh, joining us. We have a new um, person joining us today and we're super excited. So um, partner in crime, Jen Eldridge, how are you? <laughs> Hi, I'm awesome. I'm, I'm super excited about the oxen. They look just so yummy already from the Google photos. <laughs> Oh, we're excited too. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Of course. And as always, I know everybody knows, but for our new students, um, if you need to contact me, um, you can privately chat me. Um, also, my phone number is in the email that you were sent. If you need to get in touch with me for any reason, if you're having technical issues or have a question, I'm here for you. Okay. Thanks. Great. Perfect. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to switch the camera so you can uh, see what I'm working on. Yeah, I'm going to move this a little bit. So first thing, uh, it's always so hard to do a couple of things. Uh, it's hard to curate images because even though we brought like a, um, as diverse as possible range of uh, images, uh, we had a very specific criteria. There had to be oxen that were um, by themselves in the wild or in nature and not confined, no fences, no human beings. So there was a very specific reason. We invite you to watch the uh, inspiration, be, be inspiration behind the uh, webinar um, because uh, there was a very, uh, very strong criteria. So we compiled a series of images uh, of uh, oxen from different countries, we have to say. and. Uh, I, I mean, personally, I, I've been infatuated with um, oxen from Scotland, of all places, uh, with this uh, super sexy, hairy stuff. Um, but there were oxen from India, there were oxen um, from, I think, Ethiopia. Um, and we tried to uh, find different locations and different um, uh, looks, I guess. So one of the things that is also becomes very hard, very hard of from a personal point of view is uh, for me to select one of the image. I'm always at a loss. I don't know which one. I uh, I spend time thinking I like this, but then I'm not sure about the other one. To resolve this, I use um, online number generator. <laughs> so I input. We had 16 images. I put from one to 16. The computer wizards, please give me a random number. And they said two. So it wasn't taken. And I chose this one. And I was like, ah, I'm not sure I like this one the best. But as usual, and it always happens like this, um, there is so much that I learned from images that uh, were not perhaps on top of my list. And, and then they turn out to be the best, um, the best uh, possible choice. So uh, there you go. So Jen, there are plenty of... Um, online number, uh, random number generators, but perhaps if you can find a couple or, or one and then just put it on the test, on the on the chat, because it's sure. kind of like fun to delegate. I don't know if we should do that, but uh, to delegate the job of selecting. I wish we could do that with other stuff, but anyhow, <laughs> to someone else, to a machine, I guess. 
Um, all right, so that's out of the way. First thing, extremely important, we have to reformat the image onto our own format. I'm gonna talk about those two things. The difference between format and painting surface. They're completely different format comprises or takes care of three elements. The size, the shape, and the orientation. Size, 12 by 16 in my case, it's a little bit large uh, for the amount of time. And um, the nine by 12 is ideal, but just depends on whatever format you use, whatever size, it's important you understand that's gonna require more or less work, uh, more sessions or less sessions. Um, so, Second thing is um, first the size, then the shape. I'm using rectangular, and it just depends uh, what you're using. If you're using uh, square, another popular size or uh, shape. And um, sometimes uh, people use uh, round. Uh, we had it be, uh, actually two weeks ago. And then um, it wasn't round, but the person painted on a round. Uh, shape and oval. So there are different kind of like shapes. And then orientation. I'm going to use landscape orientation. There are two main orientations, portrait and landscape. So I'm taking care of that. And I know that there has to be some sort of like retrofitting, unless um, I would have the exact same proportions on this uh, photograph, which uh, we used to do that before, but we don't anymore. So I'll have to retrofit um, the format of the photograph. Photographs also have format with the format of the painting. And that's very important because sometimes we don't take care of that or we don't have it in our list of things to think about. And then we start doing like uh, the uh, focal point and then we realize that format wise, there's a bunch of things that are not happening in a space that feels completely uh, abandoned. Or maybe we have some weird cropping or some kind of like edges touching some of the uh, sides of the format. So assess your format, find out, and literally go down these three elements, size, shape, or, um, and orientation. Um, I'm using as a, a painting surface, I'm using cotton paper. There are different kinds of painting surfaces. Canvas is very popular, not our favorite for uh, several reasons. We'll go into detail later. Um, there is wood panel, there is gesso, um, uh, on top of like raw wood panel, there's mylar. Um, so there are different kinds of like surfaces and you have to understand that each surface will require a different approach. So uh, sometimes we think, oh my gosh, the painting is hard or oil is hard or this is hard. And we don't take into account that the painting surface um, has a lot to do. It's not the same painting on paper than painting on uh, pre-primed uh, uh, um, uh, wood panel, for example. So that's my painting surface. And then uh, um, you may see things happening differently, maybe more drips or less drips. So it's important to have that in the back of your mind because things may not look the same when you apply the paint. And uh, so I took care of that. And then the most important compositional elements, which I feel like, oh, I have a, a little visitor, a squirrel. The most important, um, uh, compositional elements. There are several compositional elements. Uh, we talked about those in previous uh, tutorials, but you need to know the most about two. Focal points and movement. Focal points and yes, that's uh, <laughs> perfect, Jen. Random.org. Yeah. Um, so what's a focal point? So the focal points are the where the attention gets concentrated. Uh, focal points are um, uh, things that uh, become the protagonists, visual protagonists of our compositions. Uh, and traditionally, and we like to talk about uh, tradition versus breaking the rules. We think it's important to stick with a traditional approach, get familiar with that, and then you can break the rules and make it your own. But um, in order to understand the uh, the basis for that tradition, it's important to get familiar with it. So traditionally, um, it is not recommended to exceed three focal points in one composition. Why? Because uh, uh, when you go beyond three focal points, things become very um, uh, diluted. There's more distraction. There's more competition between different uh, areas of the painting. So um, three also creates a dynamic. Um, 
uh, there is even a, a further sub rule about uh, odds, preferably um, versus uh, even numbers. Yes, right. So uh, three, just it's the minimum amount of elements that could create a dynamic uh, interaction without uh, diluting or competing with each other. So does it mean like you only have to paint three things tops? It does not mean that. It means that you can group together things um, in, in a way that feel uh, they're sort of like uh, within the same um, treatment, for example. So yeah, luckily with this, we have uh, 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 very strong focal points, obviously the, uh, the oxen or the ox on each of the photographs, but then there are some landscape, landscape elements. So be mindful that the more definition and contrast you bring on different parts of the landscape, the more are going to grab attention away from other focal points. So um, second compositional um, principle or element that's extremely important, it's called movement. Movement, it's not uh, how things uh, have the illusion of moving on the composition. Movement is related to the space that you leave around the edges of your format to provide a path for uh, the viewer to wander around the focal points. If you um, uh, squeeze that path or create interruptions, what um, happens traditionally is that you are making it harder for the viewer to actually um, go around the focal points and uh, have enough time. Okay, so I just got like a little note. Emily is not gonna join, join us, I think. Uh... Okay, so Jen, I'm gonna send this uh, really quickly to you. Okay, if you can take care of this. Sure, of course. Um, sorry guys. Uh, okay, perfect. Sorry. Um, yeah, so anyhow, um, yeah, so um, I've that's gonna be, yeah, so focal points. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, movement. So that's the reason why I aligned um, the uh, image to the bottom of uh, the format because I want to give a little bit more space above. So first things um, um, first, I'm just going to uh, start building my scaffolding. So I try to find, if you don't have like a printed image, you can also find out uh, from a digital uh, image. Go around your um, the edges of your format and see if you can find any lines. Like for example, this could be a good line this could be a good line. Any crop lines that you could uh, make marks or you could use to make marks around uh, the format. So um, why? Because you know we're, we're using the sides as a reference and um, almost imagine this as an as a as a as an empty or a blank ruler without measurements, but uh, still a way to give us some sort of orientation. If I see this, I know that it's not in the in the center of the uh, bottom side, but it's sort of like off the center. So I could kind of like um, guess more or less the orientation of that mark. So again, the reason why I'm using the sides or anything that uh, it's cropped, it's to uh, visually find out actually I should, I should have a yardstick. Um, I have one in the studio, but Anyhow, so I'm just doing this right here. So this will be my mark. So I'm making marks around um, around this. And also what I'm gonna do is I am going to um, use the handle. Here we go, there was a little bit less. I'm using the handle of the paintbrush again as a ruler, as a measuring tool just because I have this printed and I can do it, but you may not be able to do it if it's uh, on a digital screen, but you can still use the sides of the format um, of the photograph in order to uh, pinpoint or guesstimate the orientation. It's, it's purely based on orientation. There is a sense of like uh, exercising our sp sp spatial capabilities to find ourselves uh, in a place um, that um, is uh, uh, part of a reference. Let's just put it this way. <laughs> oh my 
god that was hard okay i'm just gonna get the top and the top it's a little bit easier because it just goes this way so this will be the top of my composition and notice how i'm starting to build my scaffolding before my potato shapes scaffolding potato shapes so i'm gonna explain what that is but essentially what i'm doing is rather than just putting a mark or a point i am um uh, establishing heights, um, establishing vertical uh, distances, because this is a, a way of uh, not having to worry about a specific point in the space that I have in the blank space. That would be a gambling, essentially. So rather than you gambling, which I'm not very good at, what I'm doing is um, I am just like establishing an approximate um, orientation of, yeah, of the distance between um and then i'm just going to do it like this the distance between things so what am i doing so um what I, what i think i want to make sure that the um that i'm doing is that i'm not um i'm not measuring things from all four sides of the photograph the four corners because i know that my format my painting format is different than the uh photograph uh, photographic format so what i'm doing is I'm starting all my measurements from one vertical line from this one. So I know that whatever I measure or whatever I'm able to kind of like compare, um, it starts from one point and it doesn't get uh, distorted by measuring from this point and then from the other point. Because if I do that, I'll be retrofitting or I'll be kind of like uh, reformatting my, um, um, my image based on a different um, relationship uh, between height and width and things will start getting like uh, very distorted so distortion is okay but uh, i'd rather just take my measurements from one point and see how that works and then i'll do the same from the bottom part so that way i assure that i give more movement on the top and a little bit more movement also on this side so there you go and i'm just gonna do this why i'm gonna shorten it a little bit so and this is a little bit lower okay so this will be my parameter on the left so again leave movement around um your format think that any interruptions or anything that gets really squeezed against the edge becomes an interruption is that bad it's not bad but we have to understand how perception works because someone looking at our painting they won't be able to articulate all these kind of like principles of composition and perception and movement and focal points um, but it is our job to take into account uh, these elements this criteria because we can facilitate uh, the viewing of our own uh, piece and we can also increase the amount of time someone uh, looks at our painting so these are all um, sort of like behind the scenes um, tricks and um, principles that the viewer has doesn't have to have any idea about, but as artists, we can use to our benefit, um, to, um, yeah, our benefit. Okay, so I think, and I'm just going to measure the bottom. I think I did. Okay, so I have the mark at the bottom. I have the top. I have the side. I'm going to go ahead and do my uh, potato shape. And what's a potato shape? Potato shape is like a broad um, um, silhouette that will allow me to um, figure out if I'm content or happy with um, the size and the location of my uh, focal point. So this goes down. So now that I have my uh, parameters, my scaffolding, my lines that kind of like tell me how far, how tall and how far to the left I, 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 I allow myself to go, then I can just do um, my, uh, yeah, I can do my potato shape. So again, the potato shape, it's a, a non-committing shape. Uh, it doesn't have uh, the function of determining if what we're doing is good or bad. The function of our, what we call potato shape, because it's sort of like irregular and amorphous and uh, random, um, it's to just allow us to find out if in the spatial um, area that we are going to work on, the focal point that we have chosen 
uh, flows or the energy flows or assess if there's any cropping that feels weird, any interruptions. So the first thing that we do is assess the arrangement of elements on our uh, format. We, we rush to likeness because we feel uh, very insecure about our own capabilities. And then we feel like the more, uh, we, the more details we add, the more we can tell ourselves that at least we've done something. But the, the, the point here is to slow down, really it's to slow down and think of your format as a space that we're giving, we're given and think of the focal points as elements we have to arrange within the space. So here we go, this is a little bit lower. So because I'm using a charcoal, which is wonderful, I'm allowed to treat my, um, painting surface, see how I go back from format to painting surface, uh, almost as a chalkboard, and then redo and repeat. And here, let me introduce the two most um, useful uh, elements in our um, uh, beginning of the process. Um, repeat and simplify, repeat and simplify. Um, so naturally we come, uh, this becomes the source image and it, it, it means a lot of things and it doesn't mean uh, other things. Um, the source image is not here to tell us if you're not doing exactly what I'm showing you, you are wrong. It, it's not there for that. The, the, this is a source and as a source, um, it just provides the information that we want out of it. So it's really important not to get, not to get caught up with the photographic aspect of the source. The source is here to provide information for us. That's it. Um, we just take what we want, but we don't have to take everything. So uh, that's a perfect definition of simplification. I don't have to do the hair right now. And uh, I would, we would recommend not to go there. Um, uh, but um, it's here to tell me, okay, so, um, you know, that's how, uh, as much as I'm gonna do, I'm, I have to simplify. Let me just kind of like bring another uh, scaffolding. This is good, I think that's okay, I'm okay with that. These lines will move uh, in a very organic way um, as we start uh, building our, our um, more elements on the, uh, on, on the space. So what I'm doing is I'm going over the lines and I'm starting to treat the lines as if they were sculpting wires, very malleable and then uh, really flexible. So what I do is now repeat. So simplify is take what you want, but you don't have to take everything. So that's simplification. And uh, now I'm molding this kind of like a, um, a sculpting wire by repeating. I go back and forth and I make uh, tweaks and changes to that committing. What's, what's the result of all this? The fact that I have just a silhouette allows me to make changes easily. The minute I start doing structural lines and details, I am trapped. I feel like, you know, I'm starting to put boulders in my bag and uh, the load's becoming heavier and heavier. Talk about the analogies between um, the concept and then uh, how we feel. And then I just feel really stressed and really frustrated because I feel I cannot do anything. I just wanna throw this um, over the cliff essentially. Um, but in order to avoid this sense of being overwhelmed, what I do is I just um, entertain and mold and go over my potato shape. It's easy to erase. I don't, I'm not committed to it. It's gonna change. It's a little bit flat here. Uh, my brush stroke is kind of like quick. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not doing sort of like slower things. I think that's okay. All right. So I think I'm, I think I'm okay. So this was from a potato shape to something that's a little bit less, a little bit less uh, amorphous. Um, okay. Structural lines. What are structural lines? Once I have the silhouette, um, it, it could be now a, a good time to kind of like stop and we have like time. Yeah. I'm just going to make sure we have time. So to find out if the size and the location of your focal point, focal points, um, it's okay. So 
um, I, I try not to uh, invoke or summon any uh, uh, self-judgment. Of course, this doesn't look like uh, anything yet. It could be, I don't know, it could be a, a weird bird. I, 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 but I'm not interested in judging if it's recognizable, if it's a bull or a cow or an ox, or if it looks uh, infantile or amateurish. Those are ghosts that I'm, I'm, I'm making sure um, I asked them to sit down and, uh, and be quiet because <laughs> I'm working. <laughs> so um, I'm talking to my own ghost, by the way, <laughs> not to you guys. So this is a perfect structural line that uh, splits the silhouette into smaller fragments. So structural lines are that. Lines that you can pinpoint and recognize that allow you to break up the silhouette into smaller areas. Structural lines are not details. Details will fall within structural lines, but I'm not starting with structural, I mean, with details um, first. So uh, another structural line, I think that clearly I have to do um, the nose. Uh, so this is something that it's not attached. So how do I do that? Well, this is gonna be a mini, a mini shape, mini potato shape inside of the potato shape. So perhaps I should do my own personal kind of like scaffolding type of thing. So a little bit like this and especially measuring from the other side. Yeah, here. Uh, bottom, it's really close. I don't need the scaffolding at the bottom. So what I'm gonna do is I try to put the lines uh, or measure somehow. And again, it's all a, it's all a estimation. Um, I, I don't, I feel like um, being too exact at this stage just builds up um, too much pressure. I, I feel really um, claustrophobic um, if I uh, set myself very rigid, um, very rigid approaches or measurements. Okay, so I think I'm okay with that. Uh, again, potato chip first. And then what I do is I flicker my eyes back and forth and then I just try to finesse or recalibrate the best that I can. That's all, that's all I could hope for. Um, the different nuanced uh, shapes on that part. So, okay, so that's my other one. And then there's the hair. I'm not going to do the hair right now. You know what I'm going to do? Since I have like lines right now that are clearly cropped um, based on the main focal points. Like for example, this line right here between the lawn and the upright trees, there's a diagonal line. And since this occupies a little bit less than 50% of the composition, which means that um, in a way, because of the spatial uh, takeover, this becomes a focal point. And I'm deciding this um, uh, on my own. So what I'm gonna do is actually, I'm gonna take an opportunity to, uh, to do that, to bring uh, structural lines. I try to group things together. So um, I'm not doing leaves right now. There's something here that I don't know what it is. It looks like a little tiny house. Um, and here's my, here's my um, perfect example or exhibit A of adding excessive focal points. There's an object right here and I feel, oh my gosh, this is so cute. What is this? It's like a mini house. I love mini stuff. I don't know. I feel like, you know, maybe I feel like I, I could uh, add it. If I add this, this becomes another focal point. So then I have the um, ox. Then I have uh, the landscape. I have two focal points. Do I really want to add this? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe the sky will be my third focal point. So then I don't have to uh, make this compete against um, the ox. Again, these are traditional rules. You you do, um, uh, um, you're the, oh my gosh, I was gonna use the word master, but Jen, ever since you we talked about the word master, I'm like- Gosh, I know. And now I can't hear it. I had- I know. I acting webinar where someone talked about where the instructor talked about the master reel and instead of the demo reel she was like in your master reel and it made my ears burn every time seriously yeah. not that. no 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 that's not what we say <laughs> <laughs> um yeah well we're just kind of like a segue to why um you know we learned a lot over the past like uh, 12 months but during the 
uh, protests, uh, there was so much information that we had to learn on our, on our own. And uh, language matters, as we know, language matters. And we're so happy that language matters more now than ever. And it should matter because I feel like, you know, sometimes we get into patterns that uh, we feel uh, they're okay, but it's just, uh, they're not okay uh, for other groups of people. So anyhow, um, we sort of like uh, backtrack uh, or um, uh, learn about the source of the word master, which is a word that's used with everything. And it essentially, I'm just gonna kind of like simplify it, I guess. The word master comes from, um, it's like a slavery term or a term used during slavery. So it's amazing how language um, uh, affected um, uh, our uh, vocabulary because uh, words like, for example, master bedroom, um, it was the designated bedroom of the master of the plantation. Um, and when you told me that, Jen, I was like, Psh! it's like someone's slapped me in the face. <laughs> I know, I know. And it's funny because you know, you know my obsession with HGTV and how I watch Home Improvement all the time. And you can tell where the point was to where the producers or the host, whoever had this um, acknowledgement start saying primary and you it is you know, grating on my ears when I don't hear like when I hear master bath master bedroom right but in 2021 there there must have been a point in 2020 to where they were started to film and started saying the words primary but even the designers in you know the deep south which is where I'm from um are now saying primary and it's uh it's really exciting <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think it's amazing. And it's just, uh, I, I love you know, making sure that this, because this is not the first time that obviously, I mean, it's the first time for us or for me, I should say, but you know, there's, there's a history of people saying, you know what language, uh, it's part of the systemic way of um, uh, creating oppression. Anyhow, I was going to say, you know, you're the master of your own decisions. Uh, I don't know if that word exists, but then I stopped myself and I said, whoa, you know, even like uh, I was like scrolling, uh, scrolling on Instagram. And, you know, um, like a year ago, um, or I, I think to me, at least to me, there was the, the typical master class, which is like a very fancy TED talk. You know, you see like, you know, whoever is going to teach this time. Um, uh, uh, acting or writing or... Um, uh, Anna Winter is going to teach a master class in fashion, and and now I read the word master class, and I'm like, I don't know if they could have changed that a little bit because that word, you know, it's really powerful. All right, well, let's just go back. Sorry for this kind of like segue tangent. Um, the idea is that you make your own creative decisions. You are the director of your creative process. So. We encourage you to consider the uh, traditional approaches and we want to explain why they're so good to um, avoid risks and then avoid putting yourself in a corner. We encourage you also to learn about them by practicing them, by being familiar, by being fluent. And then you make your own uh, sort of like decisions later um, when you feel like you understand the implications. Oops, what am I doing? So structural lines, yeah, so uh, simplification. And I think I'm just gonna group things together. This is fine. And okay, so I have, am I okay with this? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna move to the, no, maybe details. I'm just gonna do the separation of the hair. And I think, um, I think that's okay, so. I think that's fine. I don't have to be specific. I don't have to, this doesn't have to make like sense. Uh, uh, I have to work in building the foundation. All right, so I'm gonna go to the final stage of um, sketching because I wanna move on and then do the wash before the first hour. And that means that, um, so I've, I've been able to do several stages and several steps and uh, adding the details, maybe I should add the details, ne Never mind. Scratch what I just said. I'm going to, whoops. I'm going to do the beautiful shape of the nose. All 
I remember, Jen, we were at Artworks and we were talking with uh, a friend of ours. And then uh, we made, she made a joke, you know, you're such a slave driver. I mean, the expression slave driver, it's a, another example. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> we, used, we used to use it like, you know, I don't know, it just meant, but boy, no one uses that now. Yeah. I mean, seriously. Um, anyhow, anyhow, anyhow. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said times have changed. I was going to say changing, yeah. but they're not a change in. They have just changed. Yeah, and actually, uh, this is so good to talk about this, just because uh, going back to the actual uh, webinar and um, the way John Baldessari used language um, uh, as intrinsically attached to uh, creativity and the creative process. He moved away from painting. Uh, we can talk about it um, later he moved away from painting by uh, burning all his pieces mm -hmm. i mean very very dramatic of him and mm -hmm. then also yeah so i just did a little bit of the details right here oh, yeah, yeah. and then he moved into conceptual art and um, naturally with conceptual art um, he used language and he talks about language as being one of the cores of creativity and in that aspect that i uh, sympathize. Um, so language, articulating ideas, um, I do feel it's part of uh, the decision-making process. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go to shading and what does that mean? So now that I have the lines, this feels very linear. Anything that's very linear feels very two-dimensional. I need to transition from two-dimensional to creating the illusion of three-dimensional. And how do I do that? Um, essentially, what I do is try to um, identify a scale of values. What is value? Value is the amount of light reflected or uh, on a surface or the lack uh, thereof. I think that's a good a way to, again, um, I'm not going to go to um, grammar heaven, heaven, but as we discussed yesterday, Jen, um, we don't want to be there. <laughs> Who wants to be there? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Constantly being corrected um. by other Grammar angels. <laughs> I'm sorry? Constantly being corrected by other grammar. I know, right? Imagine that. No, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyhow, so yeah, value, that's the definition of value, how much light. And in order to build from what I have, it's traditionally a good idea, again, use that word um, uh, tradition, um, to uh, uh, de um, deconstruct or rather unpack or uh, articulate a, a general idea of how the light reflects on surfaces. And also traditionally, uh, it's encouraged to kind of like go from darker areas, darker surfaces, surfaces where the light doesn't reflect as much, all the way to lighter. Doesn't mean like we have to do a bunch of scales. We could do just like where the darkest darks are, the medium uh, spectrum, and then where the lighter areas are. We have to do an exercise of imagining um, that there's no color on our composition. And if you guys work with um, a digital image, perhaps that could be your advantage versus what I have. Uh, you could turn that image into a black and white, which helps tremendously. And then um, facilitate or um, make it easy for you to identify where are the darker areas and where are the lighter ones. It takes 10 seconds. Uh, you can do a duplicate or save it um, as, an, as, a, as, as another image. And it really helps in uh, finding out uh, the scale of values. Um, so um, if you don't have that, if you have like a printout, then you just have to imagine and um, find out, squint your eyes, that helps a lot, and find out where the darker areas are. And if you notice, I'm using already um, this, the, the side uh, of the charcoal. The more pressure you put um, on the paper, uh, the more charcoal is going to um, be left. So as I do this, um, I'm going to mention that very important, uh, I, I, I went from simplification and repetition as principles to consider at the beginning. But I want to talk about the concept of non-association right now. Why? Because as we add elements, uh, there's that um, ghost of judgment that we asked to sit down and be quiet. To uh, It's going to start making noise and saying, well, you know, this, is, this looks terrible. This doesn't look very good. 
And um, the principle behind that self-criticism is associating what we do with uh, an idea, with an image, with something that um, we feel like this should look like. Um, so non-association means to observe something regardless of what it is. It could be um, the portrait of, I don't know, um, someone we love, um, our, our celebrity crush, whatever. And, and something that we feel like really pressured to do um, amazingly. It doesn't matter. You just um, bring your eyes to an area, remind yourself, uh, re let's remind ourselves of what it is that what we're doing. We're doing values, we're hatching, and then apply it where you see it. Don't think about uh, this is the area that uh, will determine if this is good or bad. Um, no, I'm just like a steel building. There's so much that I need to do. So I'm just gonna bring a little bit of uh, uh, the idea also behind um, moving to shading is fading uh, any line work into a shape. So then it just becomes a little bit less harsh. The linear sketch, um, it, it, it's it's a it's it's uh, yeah. I'm gonna use the word harsh. It's really strong. It's very harsh. You know, we 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 let our inner critic kind of like stand up and start like uh, saying nonsense too early. It's too early for judgment, you know? Yeah, it's just, uh, it, yeah, it just, um, it takes years to, I'm not quite there yet, to uh, to ask the inner critic, inner critic to sit down and be quiet. <laughs> All right, so then the bottom of the horn, the bottom of the horn, it's a little bit darker. So I, I'm, I'm not super tidy. I work still fast. Um, tidiness and perfection and exactness is not part of um, what I'm doing. It's, it's not even in the list of things that I have to consider. Uh, it's mostly um, to give me an idea. So this is a little bit darker. To give me an idea of where the uh, light and shadow is gonna be. A little bit of shadow underneath, and then a little bit of shadow. I'll, I'll deal with the canopies, um, uh, the tree canopies later. So again- Can I interrupt you real fast with a question? Oh, tell me. Sorry, um, I just wanna make sure I gave the right information. Um, so one of our painters is working on a Canson board. Um, and says it's pretty smooth. It, it, do they need to treat it in any way before painting, or it's it's good to go? Uh, is there if they can't? It's good to go. Oh, okay. okay. So if the board, that's what I thought. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. If the board is not primed at all, if it's just like a raw wood, like dry raw wood, it's going to be a challenge. Okay. Uh, if there is a gesso uh, layer, then you're good to go. Okay. And the if gesso the layer wood is usually varnished like, well, or something. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say that they'll know if it's a gesso because it's usually white. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sorry. To... Yeah. No, no, no. Hopefully, <laughs> um, hopefully that will be the case. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. If it's just. Um, if it's white, it means it's gesso. And um, they sell um, boards, um, uh, wood panels, it's called wood panels. They sell them, uh, usually uh, there's, it's primed, uh, but they also sell them completely raw, like, like, like wood, like raw wood. That is unprimed. It's gonna be a little bit of a nightmare, to be honest. It's easy to solve this, just one layer of gesso if you have it. If you don't have gesso, just paint it with acrylic, one layer, um, and that will do it, actually. Just get white acrylic, black acrylic, I mean, white, uh, better, obviously. Okay, so, uh, all right, I have 15 minutes uh, or so for uh, the next stage. I'm going to do the staining. By all means, don't feel like you have to be in sync with uh, my uh, pace. In fact, uh, one of the things that we love at the end of the session 
is to see how everyone is at, com at a completely different place um, at the end. Uh, some of you already are doing second notes by the first hour, awesome. And I love um, how Hania and Darlene, um, you guys may be done with the uh, charcoal and uh, staining, who knows, but um, so don't feel like you have to, uh, don't feel pressured to, to kind of like start uh, something if you don't feel 100% uh, committed uh, or um, content, I would say, with whatever stage. Uh, some people, what they do, I love what Denise uh, told us, you know, um, you may just uh, do the, um, you may do uh, the charcoal and then kind of like take notes or do another sketch and not really go into the painting. And then she uh, watches the webinar later um, and, and she likes to have the idea of um, how it goes. Uh, so it's your time. Don't feel obligated. Some people have uh, interruptions and you know, it's not easy. So last thing, uh, last thing is to feel uh, pressure or obligation. Okay, so I think I'm okay. And uh, this, it doesn't have to be uh, perfect again. And there's a distinction between, um, <clears throat> there's a distinction between a drawing and a sketch. I had a sketch is a dra the draft of a plan. So with charcoal, what happens is that you get really engaged and you love the malleability of charcoal, how it allows you to be tactile, uh, manipulate and mold and twist, carve and uh, build things so easily that uh, without noticing, uh, it starts taking over and then you start doing more like a charcoal drawing. It's okay, but know that this is a preliminary foundational step. And then we have to build a wash over it. And the wash is possibly gonna um, remove a lot of the definition that we have. So the more definition you have in this stage, the more that when you transition to wet medium, uh, you're gonna lose it. And uh, so just be aware of that. Again, it's not good or bad. It's just uh, understanding what happens and how it happens. So we send a picture of the palette and uh, yeah, we mentioned the brushes that we're gonna use. I'm gonna use uh, the big brush right now. We like to use round uh, soft bristle brushes just because we like, um, what was the, Jen, help me out with the seven steps of that uh, technique, the old, uh, the old masters. Oh, there the we go, Flemish. old masters. <laughs> Get, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> The Flemish. The Flemish. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Talk about, yeah. Um, anyhow, we are um, more on uh, uh, the Flemish uh, team. So, uh, which means that we like to build things by uh, thin layers. Uh, it's our approach. We like that uh, traditional um, build of oil. Some people just get the palette and start kind of like smearing stuff. You have to know what you're doing. If you're using a palette knife and you're bringing a huge amount of paint over um, the uh, painting surface. I, yeah, first of all, you have to have the, the, the mental strength to understand that that's gonna be a, a, a path in the wilderness. And those inner critics are just gonna jump on, at you like there's no tomorrow. So uh, because we use like a, a thin layers um, to build our painting, um, we like to use a round soft bristle brush. Uh, it, it just uh, doesn't need as much paint in order to be fluid. That's the reason why we use it. It's not a frivolous uh, sort of like choice. Um, round and soft bristle uh, brushes require less paint to load them when you pick up the paint and it facilitate the application of thinner layers. I personally feel it's easier. I feel um, I have chances to change. I feel um, I'm not, uh, uh, it doesn't make me feel claustrophobic in the sense like I, I feel cornered, uh, especially using oil. So we recommend that. And then the two liquids, we're gonna start using the turpentine uh, or the mineral spirits, the, the, the solvent, uh, 
liquid, uh, the liquid that acts as water on acrylic. So it, it's just a solvent. It dilutes. The main function of the mineral spirit is to dilute the painting. The main function of the medium, whatever combination it is, could be oil, it could be resin, it could be a little bit of oil and resin, it could be a gall kit, an alkite, uh, all kit, yeah, alkite, I think, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter, that's a little bit more to your um, preference. Uh, in, in traditional oil, it's just linseed oil, period. But we like to be, bring a little bit of medium to it, just so, um, it just brings a little bit more fluidity anyhow. So what I'm doing right now is a wash, a staining. So I'm gonna use a darker to lighter. <clears throat> I don't have to match uh, the colors, but um, I'm gonna use an approximate, um, an approximate uh, color range. So obviously I don't have orange. I'm gonna use orange later for sure. But for now, what I'm gonna do is uh, the burnt sienna. It's a good substitute or ne neutral element. And then with lots of turpentine, uh, so it feels almost like a watercolor. And what I do, I uh, apply chunks. So think of this as the stage that it's the most technical. It's supposed to uh, help you prime the painting surface, whether it's paper or wood or canvas, and also seal the charcoal. So it's a very specific function, the most technical stage of the whole painting process. There's no study or anything here. It's just essentially what I do is um, I, primed, uh, I prime uh, the painting paper and I guide myself by how much charcoal I have on uh, the paper. So that's the more charcoal I have, the more uh, I, I guess I'm going to go there. So uh, am I allowed to change colors? Yes, because this is a, a also dark, uh, but it's not as warm. So I'm just going to use this and build the darker. So notice I'm going darker to lighter. What else? A little bit here, maybe. If you want to make it lighter, um, we encourage you to avoid using white at this stage. Uh, and what's the big deal about uh, 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 refrain? Refrain? Yeah, I think that's the word. Uh, uh, from uh, using white, it's because white uh, or oil uh, it takes a while to dry. So um, if you use a lighter pigment underneath, a lighter pigment. What's going to happen is that uh, when, not if, when you want that area to be a little bit darker, it's going to be much more complicated and difficult to make it darker because the white pigment underneath will get picked up and then you won't be able to make it dark enough. It will happen. It will happen throughout the session. And if it doesn't happen, then I would say it's not a good sign. It will happen 100%. It happens in every painting. If you want to make something lighter at this stage, use more turpentine, not white. Um, there you go. So I hope that made all sense. And maybe that's the reason why Denise kind of like uh, says, you know, let, let him talk. And then I'm just going to get take some notes. <laughs> and I'm going to follow my own, my own pace. All right. So color feels... Uh, uh, exactness is not part of uh, the situation here. Uh, going back to what I'm doing, I'm doing a stain right now, very traditional. I'm using neutral tones. I'm not color matching. Um, I'm going to use a little bit. I'm going to cheat here. I'm just going to use a little bit of a acro uh, and block it out. So color feels, not much definition uh, in, in regards to uh, edge uh, work. So the areas are pretty much elastic here. I'll be able to uh, build some definition a little bit later. But for now, I understand the expectations. And I think that's a very good word to, word to apply of what this means. It doesn't mean like I have to uh, exactly lay the brush down in the exact uh, area that's going to be. So uh, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm just uh, applying uh, those uh, broad um, uh, brush strokes. Yeah. So the color feels, don't worry about edges. Don't worry about the drawing. We will be, by the way, just to make you feel a little bit more comfortable, we will be able to resketch this. We will be able to move the edges uh, here and there. You know what? I'm just going to use Acru right up there. <clears throat> Acru, 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 Acru. Here we go. Just, I mean, I'm sorry. Yellow ochre. My, my brain is uh, short uh, creating that. 
short circuit circuiting. I don't even know if that's a verb, but um, uh, if you feel like there's something that's uh, way too dark, you can just use the rack, which we find it's as important as the paintbrush uh, in order to assist you when you need it. If you have any drips, just wipe them off. Uh, but this kind of like helps me remove it, it's, it. It doesn't erase completely, but it just softens the amount of pigment that you have. And sometimes that could be uh, that could be a good idea. Nothing you're doing right now. And let me kind of like try to drill this in our minds. Nothing we're doing right now is wrong. Nothing we're doing right now is wrong. Um, so that's period. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> We're just building. There's just uh, work. Um, there's no, um, uh, there's creativity involved, obviously. But this is like foundational work. This is just like, um, and it's so funny. Uh, yesterday or, yeah, last night, I think. Yeah, last night. We were talking about, uh, we've been, in the first few weeks of uh, 2021, we, we kind of like refocus our attention to precisely that work, the importance of work, the importance of not, um, letting criticism get in the way of the beginning stage, the stages of any creative process. We have to set a foundation down. We have to manage time. We have to be structured. Um, we have to manage. You the, use the word manage, which it seems like a sacrilege uh, when we talk about creativity. But we have to get things down first before we can make decisions and reflect on options and make changes and tweaks and turn the knobs to... Uh, make this higher or turn this down um, without the work um, that none of that's going to happen. And um, it's funny because uh, since we're talking or we're doing like a, 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 an ox, a portrait of an ox, uh, we had an opportunity to um, read about the general uh, qualities of the animal that apply um, by uh, Eastern um, the astrology, I would say. Uh, to the general um, climate, I would say, of the year. And how funny that we talked about work, discipline, uh, commitment, uh, loyalty to a practice, uh, and then uh, reading about um, the general guidelines of or qualities of this year, the year of the ox, those exact same qualities. Um, so it was kind of like satisfying and really cool to... Um, to be able to bridge between our uh, approach uh, to this year, how you know we want to make sure that we finish more things, that we don't leave things hanging, that uh, we conclude uh, chapters, that uh, we demand more of ourselves, that we uh, set the proper um, ground for things to kind of like grow and build. And now we're doing an ox, so it just feels. Uh, sometimes, uh, conceptually, uh, paintings are as important as uh, the style uh, that we paint them or how much details and definitions. I would say uh, this happens in every painting. So I, I, I feel I'm really excited to paint this, not just because it's an animal and, and it's, it feels really beautiful and gorgeous, because it's a metaphor. Uh, uh, and I'm talking, I'm taking another segue into the concept behind it, because sometimes we put too much emphasis on scale and and rendition and, and when in fact, you know, uh, what it means is as important. So to me, this is a, a very important painting just because um, it's a metaphor for um, all the things that I want to manifest in this year, all the positive good things I want to manifest for myself. So uh, there you have it, uh, finding a conceptual connection, a, a contemporary connection in March, 2021, um, that's what we did. And it's funny because when we look d back at things that we did 12 months ago and we made a uh, writing on the gallery about why we did them, it's so nice to actually read about the conceptual context of that piece. In April uh, 2020, um, we did this because that's what happened. In July 2020, uh, we found this uh, piece of information that made us do that. Um, this will only increase in value as we move forward to um, uh, uh, following uh, subsequent, I think I can use that word, years. Okay, so uh, do I need green? I don't need green, actually. I'm just going to use a combination of 
the neutral yellow, yellow ochre could be also seen, could be seen as a neutral yellow, and the neutral blue, which is the paints gray, the cooler black. You don't have to have the same colors on the palette. You don't have to have the same colors. You want to bring green? Uh, just go for it. Bring it. But green is sort of like a really strong color. So, wow, that looks... Let me just bring some more turpentine. So one of the... Uh, when, when I use the uh, random.org uh, to uh, let the internet wizards select uh, an image for me, uh, one of the things I did not like about the image is the high saturation. You know, this is like super bright green and it's super bright orange. It doesn't feel super tonal, but I just kind of like say, oh my gosh. And I didn't have time to tone it down. So um, I think, um, yeah, I, I'll talk about color a little bit later, but um, I'm just going to tone it down here. So I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go nuts with uh, green. Um, YC. So it's sort of like a uh, muddy green or combining uh, the yellow ochre. It's a muddy green, but um, it's not even green, but it's okay. <laughs> maybe I need a little bit more yellow ochre. Uh, but notice how untidy, quick, um, uh, almost, um, I wouldn't, I would say I would use the word assertive, you know, um, I don't care. That's the, that's the spirit. I don't care what this looks like. I need to set this down first before I make any kind of like decisions. So let this almost like in the spirit of, of let, let this get, uh, let get it over with. Okay, I think I found the right order. Uh, let's get it over with. I mean, not, I mean, I'm being a little bit ex uh, exaggerating a little bit, but kind of like, for example, I added too much um, uh, darkness here. So I'm just gonna bring uh, the rag and I'm just going to empty some of the pigment. And that's why the cotton rag, it's not just a cleaning tool. It's a painting tool. The cotton rag is a painting tool. Look, I'm just creating highlights by just wiping off. Uh, I could, the, the horn is done, uh, essentially, at this stage. I don't like to overdo things. So boom, boom, done. Um, so, okay, I'm done with the wash and I just went over five minutes, but you guys <laughs> you have to forgive me. I hope you guys are already in first notes, but um, it's a good idea if you can start first notes before the first hour, but that this is where I'm at and that's okay. And that's okay. So here, I'm just gonna close some of the gaps, but what I've done is just Staining, just staining, just use neutrals. I didn't have to make any color decisions. I use browns and uh, and uh, the light blue, which is part of like a staple palette. Okay, I'm just gonna take a moment. Um, and Jen, perhaps you can, I don't know, uh, we found, we, and we are proud actually to have found some information about the Year of the Ox in Oprah Magazine, because mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel about this weekend's um, interview. Um, Jen, are you tuned? Are you gonna tune in? Oh man, I don't know. I have to say, I okay. This Go for is, it. Oh man, okay. I'm a little nervous to say this, but I actually feel a little comfortable saying it to you because I know your love of the Queen. But there's something that in just intrinsically that I love about the royal family that I'm almost afraid to know all the little secrets and mm. terribleness of it all that I kind of just want to stay out of it <laughs> as if <laughs> as if me being a part of it is something but um I don't know I feel like whatever I will know about it will come out um in so much press that uh that I don't need to watch it. And I, I, and again, I just, I don't know that I want to know. I just want them to be perfect and wonderful people. What about you? Glued. I know you will. Yes. I will I be glued. I love I Oprah and I'm so happy, yes. you know, that she's back. And I love the buzz around it and everyone's, yeah. I'm, I'm so happy that we have something to look forward to that it's not political. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I would yeah. be in the same boat as you were like, uh, 
five years ago. But right. now it's like, finally, we have some entertainment, something. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I love Megan and Harry. Like it makes me think that they have experienced whatever they've, you know, experienced. Like, oh, like I hate that for them, especially for her, you know? I know, I know. Oh yeah, yeah. And she's such a she's such a sweetheart. I think yeah. you know that I like have met her. Do you know this? Wait, what? <laughs> Total side note. So I used to do craft services in um on like television stuff and it was mainly like reality shows and game shows and I was I did craft services for deal or no deal and as we all know she was one of the models um oh wow yeah so I mean when I say I met her like obviously it's you know very much in passing and and nothing that I even remember but um, but I tell you what, I remember the people that were really terrible and mean. And then I remember the people that were, um, like really nice, but also like, um, extroverts, you know, that would come in and just right. like, tell us their whole life story. Yeah. And she was neither of those. So I tend to think that she was one of the really quiet, nice models that, you know, just kind of kept it. That's it. We're just yeah. going to judge the, her character based on that amazing experience, Jen. Wonderful. Good. You should. I, I am a trustworthy. Of- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I love. I'm jealous. A trustworthy narrated narrate <laughs> her life. <laughs> I'm jealous. I have a story. I'm going to I'm gonna be so mean and then try to uh, top it off, I, which I am not going to be able to. But it's a hilarious story that it's kind of like uh, 17 degrees of separation, but it, it's yeah hopefully it's gonna make you laugh but uh anyhow just, just going back um oh i was gonna ask you if since we found um those uh really helpful uh, conceptual uh supportive uh ideas behind uh, uh the metaphor of painting an ox in mm-hmm. oprah magazine perhaps you could just find other sources and see if you could just pick up um phrases um words that could also support that idea of the metaphor of what we're doing and, and kind of like help us get uh, more, even more mod- motivated or, or find more value in, in, in that work. How's that? Love it. Yes. Okay, perfect. Got it. So um, I'm going to continue. I'm going to move to first notes. I'm going to explain what first notes are. I like to close chapters before I open other chapters, just because I, w- I'm, I want to be clear about expectations. And at the same time, I don't want to carry weight uh, throughout the entire process. So I close a chapter for me means I let go of what that was. That had a function. The function was to prime the paper and seal the charcoal. I can cut loose and let's just move on to the next chapter. I used to kind of like uh, feel like this was more of like an, a, a, an uphill battle. So there was a huge mountain and then I just had to climb. It was a, a constant climbing and a constant um, uh, addition of uh, uh, of stones or boulders over my back. And then in the end, I just didn't want to finish anything. So I'd rather kind of like chop it off in segments. I'm not climbing. I'm just moving forward. And then I'm just cutting whatever happened in the past. I'm cutting it loose. First notes is when we start building a little bit more consistency of the paint. I'm going to explain the, te- the, the technical aspect. So instead of using turpentine or mineral spirits, what I use is just the medium. The medium that um, we use, um, and again, you don't have to have that, obviously, but we like to use uh, a combination of oil. Uh, let me just say the majority of the medium is this uh, solvent, solvent-free medium. Uh, by talking to other painters and manufacturers and uh, learning from uh, people's uh, painters' habits, we notice that um, most painters uh, stay away from just using linseed oil exclusively. And they always tend to bring a mixture of either oil or a medium. Uh, the majority just use mediums. The difference between an oil and a medium is that one is natural, one is synthetic, and that the medium, uh, depending on which medium you use, which brand you use, there are like dozens. It'll give you more um, drying time, uh, less drying time. I mean, people th- say that the drying time is the most important thing. And I have, we have things to say about that. But what we do is, um, this is a solvent-free. Um, for us, toxicity or the lack of t- toxicity is very important. So we use something that is non-toxic. And then another thing that it's non-toxic. We like poppy oil 
poppy oil, poppy seed oil slows down the drying and then it's clear. Notice the linseed oil is very yellow and this is a little bit um, clearer. So it's not transparent, but it's clear. You can use safflower oil. We have safflower oil. It's a little bit even more, oh, it's the same. Is it the same? Okay, I think we're being very picky right now. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit lighter, I guess. But yeah, so we just kind of like do a little bit of the medium and a tiny bit of the uh, oil. The point is that the medium doesn't matter um, what you use. Uh, it gives you a little bit more consistency and uh, fluidity on the paint. Um, you don't use the paint right off the tube right away, at, at least from a traditional point of view, uh, point of perspective or place. Number one, it's too pigmented. There is way too much pigment in it. And then uh, it just kind of like you reach the top of pigmentation and then that's it. You're, you're uh, in a corner. You cannot do anything with it. Um, and number two, uh, the palette, there's one difference between the raw material on your palette and the actual palette of the painting. And each painting will require its own color palette. So the idea that a color palette has to match the painting, uh, I think um, it's incorrect. We have raw material um, here. That's not the color palette. It's the raw material that we're gonna use to create the color palette. Because every painting will demand a completely different color palette. I'm gonna also, and first note is when we start building uh, shapes and um, planes and uh, facets, if I can use that word, um, that are gonna be a, sort of like building blocks. So we go from uh, a wash to areas that feel a little bit more blocked, blocked out, like from color fields to blocking out. It's an opportunity to study color, the color palette, but we're not even close to uh, blending. We may just uh, start defining edges and this is our opportunity to actually sketch again and uh, have an opportunity to study the color. We're switching brushes also from the big brush, which was really helpful to cover uh, big areas fast. Color fields, the um, uh, use of the word field, um, it, it's it, an attempt to uh, think of uh, the stage that we did prior uh, to uh, large surfaces. So that's why we need to use a big brush. But with this, I'm gonna use a medium, uh, a medium brush. What's a medium brush? What's a medium brush? A medium brush, I don't know, it's, it just depends on the brand, but something very gold, Goldilocks like, not too big and not too small. <laughs> I know that's not helpful. Uh, and so maybe a four, depending on the brand, a four, a four would be a good, it's so random. I don't even look at the numbers, but a medium brush, I like to use like different kinds, but a medium brush, this could be a good medium brush, depending on what you use, obviously, but it's not super tiny. It's not like a miniature style. Um, and this uh, is good. I, I like uh, um, to bring uh, what I call the old hairy guys, because the old hairy guys, uh, what are those? Um, so those are names. They're not actual people. <laughs> those are names <laughs> that we use uh, to designate uh, functions to old brushes that they seem like, you know, we will never be able to use them because they're completely messed up. The uh, bristles are uh, frayed. Um, you can do a single straight line with them. Uh, they're done. They're, they're, but they're not. They're the best. They're the best to build blocks and they're the best to blend. You know, sometimes uh, when you go to an art store and you see this fancy fan brushes, you know, there's one line and it's kind of like a, 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 the mohawk of a punk uh, person. I don't know if that was uh, uh, put in a sentence uh, correctly, but um, yeah, uh, those are perfect for blending, but they're too fancy and they're too delicate. You can do the same thing even better if you use a, um, an old brush that's completely frayed. So don't throw them away. Don't throw any uh, brush that feels, you know, you left for too long inside of the cup and then the bristles are just kind of like uh, twisted uh, or uh, 
brushes that uh, you use so much that the side bristles are totally um, shaved. And then you can see a few hairs on top. Each old brush will perform amazingly uh, for different functions. All right, let me just kind of like go back to business. So um, what am I doing? So I'm gonna start building some blocks, but the idea here is to follow the same order. So there's a reason why traditionally we move from charcoal darker to lighter, to wash darker to lighter, to first notes darker to lighter. And the idea is that by repeating the procedure or the order, we uh, are more efficient with our time no, and, 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 and also we kind of like follow the same, uh, uh, the same pattern. So it just helps us make decisions quickly. So I'm gonna do darker to lighter. So I'm just gonna, uh, this seems like a darker brown. So I'm not gonna study that color that much. And the idea right here is just to block out. There's a difference between a color field which has less edges um, to uh, um, blocking out, blocking out uh, automatically implies that I'm going to create some uh, edge quality. So um, the color feels flat. I'm not doing like highs and lows. That's second notes. And I think we're going to have maybe just half an hour and not even uh, for second notes. But the idea here is to just block out in a very flat way. We're doing almost like a um, stained glass window. Actually, I'm going to bring my second hairy guy. Uh, it's also old, but not as frayed. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to try to catch up, you guys. I'm going to see if I can do that. Uh, this may be. Um, uh, and, and obviously, this is something tra traditionally um, very Flemish like, and we identify with the Flemish style of painting. Uh, I don't even know if the Flemish were nice people or not, but let's kind of like stick with their style of painting. Neutrals are number one. Browns, beige, um, even yellow, from yellow ochre to uh, burnt sienna. Stars of your palette. Uh, they, they kind of like uh, become um, uh, very adaptable to different situations. So uh, there you go. I am going to, uh, yeah, um, another uh, good idea is perhaps, um, uh, what do I, what, what I want to say? Okay, let, let's kind of like uh, not change the rules because I was going to do something different and that's not going to be good. So I'm just going to stick to darker areas. So notice that I barely put any medium, maybe a little bit, because what I want is to build over the transparency that I had uh, before. So the point of this layer, not only is to start building um, blocks, literally, but also to build on the transparency of the wash. The function of the wash was very specific. And now I'm starting, or I have the opportunity to organize, arrange, compose without committing too much to detail. I'm not thinking, uh, it's not even part of my vocabulary right now, detail. It's just kind of like blocking, uh, blocking uh, areas. Um, something that uh, painting is very good at, very, and that's why precisely we should do it way more than we do it. Um, painting is very good at slowing us down. Painting is a slow art. And it's, it, you know, uh, we can read that and say, oh yeah, it's true. But uh, we, have to, uh, we have to experience it to understand what that means because it's very frustrating sometimes to kind of like, uh, go over the steps and, and see um, that it takes a long time. It takes a long time. So slow down, slow down. It's okay, we're blocking out. It's just, we're gonna be fine. No one's, um, no one's uh, telling us what to do. Uh, we are, are following our own pace. It's a little bit darker. Um, use the observation or, or yeah, apply your observational skills. What are those? Kind of like flicker back and forth from the source, the image source, and take what you need. Uh, you know, the, the, the source is there to just provide whatever we need. It's not there to dump all the information over us. So we feel like we're drowning, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, I need to do this and I need to do the hair. And there's like one 
uh, hair comes sticking out of the nose and I need to do it right now because if I don't do it, it's not going to look like, no, we, we, we go back to the image source and we pull the information that we need at that stage. We have to be uh, clear about the expectation of the, the expectations of the stage. We're building blocks, we're creating shapes, and uh, we need to be realistic about what this is not about. We're not about putting details yet, where I'm not blending. When we are uh, clear about the expectations, then we can go to the image source and take what we need to fulfill that expectation. So I try not to leave things to uh, random uh, stuff, you know, okay, I'm just gonna paint and, um, and hope that that's gonna work out. Um, I, it doesn't work for me. I just need to, I, I need to know what I'm doing. I need to know what's the expectation, where am I at, um, uh, in order to understand what kind of information I want from the image source. Otherwise, uh, I, it, it just, point blank, I'm blindfolded. I mean, I may think like I'm observing, but I'm really not. I'm just leaving it to whatever, you know. Um, and, 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 and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pin this together with uh, the metaphor of ox, you know, principle, disciplined, structured, uh, routine based, uh, exactly know what you're doing, and, and have that clear expectation about it. Um, there was one uh, expression that uh, at first it had negative connotations uh, for me, obviously, keep your head down, which um, uh, that's one of the things that, you know, it's like submission, don't question. Um, and that's not a good thing, but um, in turning that into something positive, to me, keep your head down. Uh, if there is anything positive about that, uh, stay focused, don't get distracted. Um, don't let uh, those voices um, uh, doubt what you're doing. Okay, so this could be a good moment to um, feature or explain what um, studying the color is at this stage. And perhaps um, you don't have to have it. It's a paint, a painting hack and a paint hack. I think that's both. But there's a way of study the color from the uh, image source. I didn't need to study the color earlier, uh, but now since I'm uh, at the stage that I wanna study the color and find out what kind of palette I'm gonna use, I am using this. And what is this? Uh, this is like, a, I used it like several times. It's a sheet of like cellophane or clear plastic um, that I had. And uh, you can use also if you, I mean, it's a little, it's okay. You can use, um, uh, Ziploc, you just cut it open and then you use like a one layer. But essentially uh, the function of this is to put this as a barrier between the image and um, between the image and your brush. <laughs> it's like a, no, uh, no, no. And, uh, and then what you do is kind of like a study um, study the colors. Okay, so I think this is pretty good. So you put the color sample on top and you can compare what you're seeing. There's nothing more um, clarifying than, yeah, it needs a little bit more yellow or I mean more burnt sienna. Uh, and here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start bringing uh, accessory colors that uh, this painting needs. We don't start with those colors because we don't know what kind of demands the painting uh, is gonna have uh, color-wise. But now that I built uh, my um, wash, I know that uh, most likely I will need cadmium orange and perhaps I'm gonna bring the reds just in case. And um, if you have the space, just like Lois uh, does, we're so jealous in your painting environment, it's nice to have all your tubes lined up on a surface, uh, a table, a shelf. Um, by the way, um, I know that you guys know this, but we're just gonna bring this up. Uh, Lois, if you, uh, you know this uh, already, but there is a reason why uh, every single manufacturer of paint, every single one creates the screws the, the, the cap, I'm sorry, creates the, the cap 
uh, in a way that it's a little bit wider. So you'll, you'll never found something that's round or designed um, in a very kind of like modern way. There's, a, there's always a, a, a width, but obviously not only because it's easier to turn it, uh, uh, unscrew it when um, it gets really dry, but, the, and this is true. The main reason is that you can, I mean, I'm not, uh, let me just uh, actually do it properly. Here, I'm just gonna create an accident here. You can set the tubes on any flat surface. This is the way uh, painting tubes are supposed to get stored when you are not traveling with them. Why? Because then whatever um, uh, oil that has been used to uh, mix the paint, the pigment um, uh, with, yeah, oil and pigment, it just goes up to the bottom. How many times you have, uh, I have squeezed, uh, uh, generally it's a bad quality oil. And then a bunch of oil comes out. I'm like, I put the this on the palette and <laughs> I just have like a bunch of oil. Um, so this is the proper way um, uh, to store it. And uh, anyhow, so I don't even know why I did that and wasted time. But um, what I was gonna say is that, yeah, it's a good idea to have your colors, if you have space, um, uh, lined or uh, laying flat or separated. But if you don't have space, this looks nasty, but we recommend you just group together the colors uh, in categories. All the cadmiums, the yellows and the uh, orange cadmiums, I have them here. And all the reds, I have them here. There's nothing more annoying than trying to find a color in their color box and the color will refuse to show up. And then you have to take that box, the damn box apart. <laughs> and when you need a color to paint, you need it like an hour ago. It's just like a, we're so engaged with the process that finding a color, it's such a distraction. It feels, I, I know that it's so, um, uh, the, you know, frivolous in this feeling like on a, uh, where's the orange, where's the yellow? But it's just a reflection of how engaged we are with our process. I put a little bit of uh, orange, cadmium orange, and I'm gonna mix it with um, the burnt sienna. And I wanna find out, I think so, it needs yellow ochre. So this is how I study color. Um, I try to always make a sample, I need red for sure. I'm gonna use um, cadmium red. So that's gonna be part of the palette, I know. And I know that this is a overly saturated and it's not gonna be the same case for you guys because I feel like that, that was the most saturated image in the entire portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. So I know that it's orange, uh, burnt sienna and um, yellow ochre. Okay, so now that I studied the color, I know which colors compose or are part of the mixture just by testing it. And I feel like now I could absolutely, I'm so happy um, notice that um, I could have never created this color just uh, uh, out of a tube. So it's very important that on the first notes, uh, yes, you built, um, maybe I'll make it a little darker. Uh, you built, let me just bring the old hairy guy and see if I can cover much more and a little bit of medium. Um, you'll have to gauge how much medium you put because if it still feels transparent, it means that you're putting way too much medium and it, it, you never kind of like pin it down uh, in the first um, application. You always have to um, uh, tweak the ratio of paint uh, a few times before you actually uh, find something that's within the range. And within the range is what we want. It's never uh, exact. Um, when we have to make paint again, it's never going to be the same color. It's never exact, but that's the beauty of uh, painting, that it's not perfect. Um, uh, anything that is not perfect shows, um, and I'm going into kind of like pre preaching territory, uh, but I do, I, I do respond to uh, things that are not perfect to me means that they are human. And um, there's nothing more interesting in a painting than seeing uh, or perceiving rather than seeing the uh, hand of the artist behind 
the painting. Because otherwise, I mean, we already have the photo. Um, so I, I don't know what's the point. Uh, uh, the source is already done. Uh, the function is already done. And um, what more captivating and interesting on a creation or recreation than actually seeing uh, how the painter translated it uh, with the imperfections and the distortions and the um, intentional things and the random things that happen. All those things are beautiful because they are um, human. So I'm doing a little bit of uh, blocking uh, within the blocking, but uh, notice the pixelation. I think that's what I wanted. And I'm just gonna study this uh, orange. That's a totally different color. And again, um, uh, let me see how much time I have. We have half an hour, so I don't even know. I think I'm just going to focus on um, the ox. That's going to be my focal point. Um, it's very important also that you check the clock or you check the time uh, every few minutes uh, because I, I find it helpful to understand how much time I have left in order to organize myself and, and, and manage um, the time. I, it, this sounds awful, but time management is a crucial component in any creative process. I, I, I just, I can go over that in a different um, dissertation, but that's period, that's it, time management. It's boring and not very um, uh, creative, but it is, um, it is important. You, in order to create a strategy, you need to find out how much time you have. Uh, otherwise, you know, this could be go on, this could be going on forever. All right, let's just study that color. Again, raw material is one thing. We have to create a color palette for this painting that's never going to get repeated ever again. And that's one of the beautiful things about um, painting different subjects that every painting will have its own okay i just put orange and it's way too orange it's a little bit dark so let me just uh, um add a little bit of acro and see if i can make the value of that sample that color sample a little bit lighter it's a little bit lighter a little bit more acro i'm not putting white because i feel like the acro it's a great substitute for white at this stage okay i think that's good i feel like i need um some yellow and I have cadmium yellow and I happen to have cadmium yellow medium. Um, so with cadmium pigments, which are generally um, uh, reds and oranges, uh, they come in three uh, grades, uh, cadmium light, cadmium medium and cadmium deep. Um, and those three grades uh, apply to the temperature uh, and the uh, value of the color. So if it's, uh, there are three colors that are cadmium base, uh, yellow, orange, red. So, and then three categories within each of those colors. So cadmium yellow comes in three grades. Cadmium yellow light, which feels very uh, lemon-like, uh, really pale. Cadmium yellow medium, which is a little bit warmer and cadmium yellow deep, which starts to step into light orange territory. So um, yeah, and same thing with orange, orange, cadmium orange light, cadmium orange medium, cadmium orange deep, same thing with red. So I brought cadmium yellow medium because I feel like this is so warm. Yeah, okay, I got it, a little bit of that. Let's do it. Let's do it. Once I study the color, I don't have to do this uh, painting hack in every single square inch of the painting. It would be excruciating and it would take all the joy out of it. But I do like to understand and see color. So uh, I have fun. Um, uh, pretending to be a color alchemist and finding out where can I get that and how can I get it, mixing stuff. Um, so um, it's fun. I, it makes me real. It, it's a humbling experience to realize that even though we have eyes, 
lucky us that we have eyes and um oh that sounded bad and they are functioning that sounded worse it's a humbling a humbling humbling experience to realize that our sight it's not uh, that uh, good at picking up color for whatever reason i'm not going to go into details of why um but we think we see a color <laughs> when in fact <laughs> it could be nothing further from that color so that's why i like to study and test and not just me you'll see uh, many painters out there uh, doing color samples around uh, uh, the photos that they use of the image source um, or um, kind of like comparing their brushes um, with or against um, the physical reference if they're using a physical reference. Uh, so that's something that it's common. Uh, let me bring the, um, the hairy guy to... So yeah, um, first things first, realize that no matter how sharp your uh, sight is, uh, your brain will uh, do all kinds of like silly, crazy things um, uh, in, in deciding what color you need to use for that area. You think you're seeing orange, you're gonna put a little bit of orange and that orange is gonna be so off. Um, so I like to study that color and then uh, what am I doing right now? I'm just blocking, I'm blocking out. I'm not uh, doing every single piece of hair that I see. Um, what was important with first notes, again, expectations is that um, I'm able to study the color and block out that area with um, something that I'm content about. Um, uh, I, I would say um, we're all here uh, for many reasons, but one of them, it's because we love color. We're passionate about color. And um, I love discovering new colors, uh, mixing colors, um, but color, it's not just saturated for in, in its such maximum saturation. Color in its most desaturated could be as powerful. So um, defining what color means is step one. Uh, and uh, being humble enough to uh, understand that our mind will uh, make all kinds of like the things that are not gonna be, um, uh, or match what we see, that's step two. Okay, so I got, um, I, I'm happy about this temperature right here. I got the color right here. Do I need to do um, the same study on the horn? Maybe not, I'm just gonna be a little bit freer. You know, I, we don't have to, um, see how you feel. If you feel tired of like testing, so then just go for it, no one, no one's, watching you. <laughs> so I'm just gonna uh, put a little bit of that tone. So again, I go by, uh, by areas. So, and understand that this is not the end of the process. We are still in, in a very building mode. If you're lucky enough to be already in second notes, and I'll explain what those are before the session concludes, then that's an area where we could sort of like uh, feel a little bit less pressure. We can start engaging in making more decisions, artistic decisions, uh, but I'm not there yet. This is, I, I consider this still preliminary, preliminary work. And of course, uh, again, try to pick up the habit if you can, it takes years to kind of like approach it. Uh, okay, so to, um, yeah, to understand that this is work, that we have to do this based on uh, clear uh, expectations, uh, stages, however we find, however, however we want to define them. Uh, and we're not ready to, um, yeah, we, we have to set the ground uh, before we can enjoy uh, the process a little bit more. So I'm bringing, there's some pink here, which I'm really excited about. So I'm bringing some pink. I haven't used white yet. Um, but if I want to lighten something up, I use the substitute of white, which is uh, acro in that sense. A really, uh, the, the beige linen tone, a wonderful color to have on your palette. There's so much beige around us and, and that's wonderful. Um, 
I don't like beige buildings that much, but uh, when it comes to painting, we have to have this color. It's just a really good color to have. I don't even know what makes sound. Okay, I got it. So I'm just building those blocks. So things feel uh, um, color blocked. There's a little bit of gray. So I'm not studying the palette here. Maybe I should, but I'm not. So I'm just putting a little bit of gray. This is warm gray. So I'm gonna bring a little bit of um, the yellow ochre. I think that's good. Don't, don't feel like you have to be tidy or exacting. Don't, don't go to um, tiny brushes right now because that's gonna be part of like, sorry, I need to lower this volume down a little bit. I don't know why there's something here that makes noise. Okay. Okay. Here, 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 here. All right. So, um, yeah. Um, so we're not we're not there yet. We don't have to be exact. So um, or tidy yet. There will be a time. I'm bringing some white, but I feel like after an hour and forty five minutes, I'm okay. <laughs> I just want to make this pale, but and, and, uh, no, for sure. I'm here to tell you 100% it will happen. You will mix white or put something really light um, on a layer underneath and you will have to make it darker and it's going to uh, push against you. The white's going to push against you making it darker. It's just going to say, uh-uh, you're not going to. So um, it happens in every painting. So I think I'm just going to, just to bring it uh, to some sort of like a, a place that brings closure. I'm going to uh, study the color of the nose because I feel like that needs a little bit of study. So let me just get organized here. Okay, Jen, any, um, any uh, phrases or notes that we could use to reinforce our... A hundred percent. All right, you want to go okay. for it? Yeah, so the first thing I want to tell you, I want to read you a little story and Julio, you will laugh. Okay, so the first of all, the ox is the second of all zodiac animals. According to one myth, the Jade Emperor said the order would be decided by the order in which they arrived to his party. The ox was about to be the first to arrive, but the rat tricked the ox into giving him a ride. <laughs> then just as they arrived, the rat jumped down and oh, the head of the ox. Thus the ox became the second animal. I mean, isn't that just the truth? <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I just am fascinated by rats and horrified by them all at the same time. <laughs> Um, okay, so oxen are the hard workers in the background, intelligent and reliable, but never demanding of praise. Um, and then I read something, let me find it again. Um, they rarely lose their temperature, temper, sorry, they think logically and make great leaders, which I feel like is a good time right now, the year of the ox, it feels like yeah. this year hopefully will take on. Yeah has taken on that sort right. of temperature yeah um and then one other thing in this one oh careers careers fit for the oxen um okay it says no matter what career they choose it must i, mean, I think there's supposed to be must be something they are really interested in Though they may be okay with any job that fits their skills, they should take the time to find something they love. Only in a stable environment that matches their passions are they able to find their true calling. I felt like that was really interesting for us. Oh, yeah. To find our true passion. Okay, now it's on to the fun stuff. Okay, to have the constitution of an ox, to possess an unusually robust amount of strength, determination, and stamina so as to be able to work extremely hard and or overcome hardships or limiting factors. So I feel like we yeah. are the we could use that, yeah. in the plain air. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, and then I thought you would think this one was funny. 
ox in the ditch. This is an expression, the old ox in the ditch. Of or relating to a situation that is dire and requires urgent and undivided attention to resolve it. It comes from a biblical term, um, basically meaning something is so like crazy, like the ox is literally in the ditch, that you can break Sabbath to um, help that situation to wow. work. Um, but I felt like that you and I could use ox in the ditch <laughs> saying. Yeah. True. Now, yeah. as a as a joke. Cool. Wow. Yeah. So there you go. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm so. This is so kind of like helpful to um, find a way to articulate how to uh, face things uh, in, in regards to the creative process, if I may say. So yeah, very. I like the uh, the stability. That that kind of like uh, is a, it's a great word as well. The stability and um, yeah. So yeah. So add them to the notes. Uh, the recap notes. So I think that'd be okay. awesome if you could. Perfect. You got it. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Um, so I need a little bit of orange. So what am I? Thank you, Jen. I think that's perfect. And yes, I think that's uh, that's gonna be. Uh, I, I envision uh, painting these or going through the, the sessions or um, uh, as a, uh, an affirmation to bring the best qualities of that um, to this year. And, and I feel like really, um, that's why I'm so excited about this. And I know you were as well, because I feel like that's something that it's almost as a ritual. It's just going to feel really good. Um, uh, to do this and then to also look back. So what I'm doing right now, uh, by the way, it's just uh, applying some notes on uh, the nose. And what I did is I, I, I um, understood the structure of the color a little bit. And what I did was apply chunks. Again, this would be considered first notes, but I'm going into second note territory. And it, perhaps like, this could be a, a perfect since we have uh, a little bit of time left, not too much, but uh, to explain what would go after uh, first notes. First of all, um, if I had extra time or if I didn't talk as much as I should have, I would have been able to apply first notes on the different parts of my painting. Um, and because I mentioned, and I'm trying to be uh, consequential in my decisions, um, uh, because I said I like to close chapters before I start new ones, I would not go into detail work and blending work unless my first notes were placed. Again, blocking out areas um, almost evenly, like this one, perhaps a little bit of color, blocking out areas um, based on location. So um, I did the um, ox, the darker to lighter. Maybe I, I, I would do the green darker to lighter as well. And then I would do the sky. Um, the idea with the first notes is twofold, um, which is uh, to start helping us bring a little bit more definition on edges and also to build on the transparency of the wash, which was the stage prior. So there's a part of a, a, a technical uh, a component as well, but also... Um, we are uh, moving forward with, um, yeah, I think color, color palettes. Yeah, first notes is when we actually get the opportunity to study the color palette that the uh, image requires. And I'll say it a thousand times. And let me just say this, we've done hundreds of uh, sessions, hundreds at this stage, Jen, you and I, hundreds. There's never a moment where a session feels repetitive. We feel like in every single session, even if we say the exact same thing, but slightly change, it's an opportunity to understand that uh, stage better, to um, make sure that we amplify or expand uh, the expectations of it, the definition of it, what we need to accomplish with it, uh, how realistic we have to be with it. So. Um, I think it's important because uh, um, we are so excited that someone new is jo joining us today. And uh, but at the same time, it's so exciting to hear that people that have been painting with us for um, years, they feel like each 
painting or session uh, provides an opportunity to kind of like explore and understand that exact exact uh, thing um, again. Anyhow, so yes, I would just do first notes just like that. And then um, what are second notes? Second notes, I would go back. Um, uh, no, let me just scratch that. With second notes, I can pick the location that I want to work on based on the focal points. So there is a major um, um, shift here. I've done darker to lighter, darker to lighter from the sketch, the last part of the sketch up until now. But with second notes, and that's when uh, we can technically start enjoying the painting process a little bit more. <laughs> um, then I pick one location and the location is essentially your choice of uh, focal point. And what I do with second notes, and you can see a little bit um, what second notes are. Over the first notes, I start creating variations of the same color. So it feels as if I would choose this location just because I, I want this to be the focal point because I see a lot of like uh, gradations and a lot of color. And what I do is I use the color that I blocked out the second, the first note. I blocked out with this sort of like beigey warm um, color. And then I create a darker version of it and I apply it in a very pixelated way and a lighter version of it and I apply it in a very pixelated way. So the difference, the shift goes from first notes being a solid sort of like block, um, color block to a range within, within the same color. I don't paint with a new color. I just find variations of that exact first note. And then I build the illusion of volume. I build the illusion of light. I build the illusion of light direction. I build the illusion of edge quality. So this is the actual meat and potatoes, although I shouldn't use this expression because I don't like it. Um, but yes of painting. So everything we've done comes down to uh, being strong enough or having built a, a very stable ground, bringing that uh, amazing um, description that you just uh, said, uh, in order to uh, do the uh, an enjoyable job or the best job we can with the second notes. And then there's third notes, but we're not going to go there, but because uh, that's like even, I don't know, there's so much work to do here. But um, uh, you can bring in the small brush if you need to here, but um, I'm going to concentrate on more second notes on this area. So the next, uh, we're going to um, end or conclude the session of five minutes after the second hour. Uh, so know that we still have 10 minutes and we can do a lot. So what happens with blending? Where Where's that blending? fit and all of that, uh, this kind of like first notes, when, I, when am I allowed to stir uh, pigment here? Well, let me just tell you. Um, so it's, it, first of all, blending. Um, blending is when we create transitions um, on our painting. Transitions are organic shifts between one value to another or one color to another. So uh, they happen, we see them, um, but blending is more like a detail work. It's not what comes first. We have a tendency to blend first and then add details on top. And then it's, I, yeah. we have to build the second notes and then we can blend. So the most important thing um, that we will say about blending is the 90% of blending, the, ma the great majority of blending happens on your palette, not on your painting. We have to test the different values. We have to uh, turn uh, or move the needle to warmer or cooler, darker or lighter on the palette. The palette is our Petri dish. It's our counter. It's our uh, chopping board. It's where we do the mixing and the messing up and the uh, stirring up and all that stuff. It's on the palette and it's going to take a monumental shift in rewiring our habits to move away from blending too much on the painting and actually making it happen on the palette. Because 
since no one told us, at least I should say this to myself, we do the majority of the blending on the actual painting surface. And what happens when we do that? We lose control, we gamble, we leave things to complete randomness and chance. The painting starts, the pigment starts to pick up from each other. We start sort of like stirring the pot and then um, not creating things that are distinct enough. And everything uh, starts to what we call muddy. And then we're like, oh my gosh, I hate oil. I'm a bad painter. I suck. No, <laughs> it's because no one told us. <laughs> uh, oil is an amazing uh, medium. Blend on the palette as much as you can and apply your different uh, samples of color. Apply them as pixelated notes on the painting surface, but you have to create the samples on the palette first. So now I'm going to do this little corner. I feel it's a little warmer. I could study it or I'm not, but I'm just going to bring this uh, It's a little bit too much. Maybe I'm just going to bring some orange. So I'm going to tone it down. So I'm going to bring this and fine. I did a pixel. Look, this is a pixelated. It's one spot, one pixel, one color sample. And now I'm going to bring a little bit of a variation of the color, maybe with a darker brown. And I'm going to apply that right next to the pixel. So, okay, so I got another second pixel, maybe it's some in between. So I got two pixels right next to each other, but I blend it on the painting palette. And then what? I'm going to clean my brush. Um, you can use like a soft brush, I think so. No paint whatsoever. And what I'm going to do right now between the two pixels, I will very lightly sort of like blend the edge. And I constantly clean any excess pigment because I don't want the pigment to kind of like uh, contaminate, although this is uh, such a dramatic word, uh, um, different areas. but. There is a lot of cleaning with a dry empty brush or clean brush. And I only tweak sort of like the edges that I feel I need to blend. Not everywhere, not everywhere. Not everything needs to be diffused. Maybe this area could be diffused. <laughs> so I'm just gonna soften this between because there's a very soft edge. There, I just... Uh, I need to perhaps bring some of the color now behind the nostril. This is uh, feels a little bit too interrupted. Okay, here we go. And then, yeah, that's a little bit better. Maybe now this needs to be a little softer. So I, I, I have now control in regulating or recalibrating how much of the fuzziness or the, um, um, yeah, softness of that blend I want. Like for example, there is definitely a uh, softness on the hair right here. And we haven't even gone to uh, the hair. So here we go. I'm softening this area, but I have to be careful because if I widen this too much, I think this I'm happy about. So maybe I should bring that reddish tone to the inside of the nostril. Pixelate it, study it on your palette, pixelate it, clean your brush, and then I see um, that this is not just like super dark. So I need to make it a little bit lighter. So let me just bring some of the lighter notes. It's much easier to make something lighter on oil than to darken it. So that's why everyone says darker to lighter, not the other way around on oil. Sorry about all these like notifications. Ay, 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 ay. Whoa. Okay. This is just not good. Um, anyhow, so notice that what I did, I blended the pixels, the pixelated areas between them to create the idea instead of like an orifice, sort of like a fold of the skin. So this would be second note work, second notes. So it's when you, um, I feel like I put too much red here. So I can now, I can now be in a position where I can make decisions based on um, things if they're too warm or too cold. At the beginning, I, I was a little bit more uh, assertive with the application of color. 
So I feel like this definitely uh, needs to be toned down. So I bring a little bit of burnt sienna, a little bit of burnt sienna. And, and then I lift the brush and I let it be. Because sometimes uh, I feel like we um, tend to gravitate. After, after working uh, for a while on an area, we will have our favorite uh, spots. It will happen. So um, we just have to be aware that uh, those favorite stops, I mean, those favorite spots, uh, they're not the spots that we should be hanging out uh, too, for too long, you know, to make us feel comfortable. Uh, because then we're just going to create this uh, dichotomy be between our favorite spots and the, the spots that, quote unquote, we, uh, we hate or we dislike. So do a little bit of work and then move on somewhere else. Because there's going to be another layer uh, that in which we're going to go back to that area and build it a little bit more. But there's no point in spending all your energy and creative uh, juice um, to just make that area even more further away from the rest. So I think what I would do, maybe I'm just going to move to uh, the bottom because this area feels still very dry. So let me blend uh, on the palette. Let me blend on the palette. And then I'll just do a little bit of a chunk here. This is a little bit lighter. So let me just do a color sample on the palette. I could use the, uh, the cellophane, but I'm not going to. It's a little, oh, that's maybe I should actually, because that's not the color that I wanted. A little bit lighter. Maybe some uh, yellow ochre because it's starting to get really dark and yellow ochre contains white in it. No, I'm not happy with it. I'm not happy with it. Maybe some orange. Yeah. Uh, cadmium orange also has um, a lot of like lightness. Yeah, even a little bit more. I'm, I'm not using white yet, but I think I may have to. Okay, I think that's okay. Yeah, I think that's good. So I bring this lighter. Again, it's much easier to paint lighter notes over darker than the other way around. So that's why it's good to build your dark st structure first, and then you can always apply uh, the lighter tones over it. They have more coverage. You'll be able to um, do it in a much um, easier way um, than the other way around. If you have whites underneath or light tones, and you're trying to make them darker, they're not going to let you. You know, They're just going to push against. And then what do you do? Let me just explain. Oh, well, the easy solution. The rag is our friend. Wrap your finger, your index finger with the rag, and then wipe it off. <laughs> you can start from scratch. So this is our er oil eraser. Uh, any area that you feel it's building up with too much oil, and you're not able to really make it darker because you have a lot of white pigment or pigment that is light underneath, and it's just give, it's giving you problems and it's making you frustrated. Um, just gently uh, remove uh, any uh, uh, excess pigment, and then start from scratch. And then when you start from scratch, build your darks first. You have an opportunity to rebuild that area. So darks first and then apply the lighter notes on top. So I think I'm happy with uh, that uh, application. I'm just going to move to darker brown right here. Um, so it's a little bit around it. I think that's OK. Uh, just pixelating the darks, pixelating with maybe the Van Dyke brown underneath, because I like this super dark area. Van Dyke brown underneath, Van Dyke brown below um, the lip. And then I'm going to clean my brush. I'm going to clean my brush. OK, I'm going to clean my brush. And with a clean brush, I am going to soften that narrow um, uh, line or, or separation between. And notice that I clean my brush. I do a couple of strokes um, to blend. So I'm using my brush as a blending tool, not as an um, applying paint tool. Um, and that's something that also no one told us. No one told us that brushes uh, don't have a single function uh, to constantly apply paint, you know, nonstop. We feel like we get a brush, 
we have to do something with it. So pick up, scoop up some paint, paint, scoop it up, paint. It's nuts. No, <laughs> brushes are tools. You can use the brush uh, in different, with different pressure, uh, with different angles. Um, you can also um, use a brush without paint to blend. Um, so brushes are tools uh, and as they're good tools as any other tool, uh, we can use them for different functions. Uh, so the process of painting, very important. And I think I'm gonna conclude the session right now because I'm getting carried away. The process of painting, it's not a mindless um, process uh, that requires uh, uh, the concept of adding at every stage. If we are painting, it must be because we're adding, adding layers, adding color. You have to step back, you have to slow down, you have to assess and evaluate the stage you're in. You have to find out what is that it's required and what do you want out of the uh, image source and then make a decision. But it's not a constant, you know, a restless application of paint one layer over the next. That is making a bunch of paintings over one. And then, um, but let's just end with a light note, um, just like a 1010 uh, here in LA. I know that uh, we have a wonderful painter joining us from the UK. This is what's gonna happen. We're gonna take a 10 minute break or one, uh, we're gonna reconvene at 1.20 or uh, 20 minutes after the hour, whatever your time zone is. I know that the, the lovely painters in Maine uh, are joining us as well. And so 10 minutes, uh, first thing, drop your brushes, stretch. Our bodies get really tense and also our muscles tense up. Painting is a, a physical experience. People don't even know what it takes to paint. Uh, I laugh. We laugh when we say, you know, yeah, it's just to um, <laughs> calm ourselves. <laughs> that happens, but there's a lot of physical work. Drink, use the restroom because our minds are so engaged. We forget about our, uh, uh, our body's needs. Grab a, a bite, 10 minutes go really fast. Within those 10 minutes, make sure you take a picture of the stage of your work, whatever it is. Uh, even, even if you just did one line, if you wanna share it, don't feel obligated, but uh, uh, in the remaining time until the next hour, we'll do some uh, critique, um, we'll uh, share the work and then see if we can just provide any um, advice or tips to, um, for you to continue working on it. Uh, we assume that every single piece is a work in progress and uh, there's much work to be done. So don't feel like, you know, the work is not uh, good enough. There's no such a thing. Okay, I'm gonna um, take a break. We'll see you uh, at 20 minutes past the hour. <laughs> 